From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 116, recorded on September 7th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, that's you. The first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's been two weeks much has happened in the meanwhile. People have been born. People have died. Infections have occurred. The earth is turning. The earth is turning. The moon circulates. That's right. Zika is still out there. And there has been a possible hurricane. Did you go uh, sailing in the hurricane? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Much against the orders See, now, of the governor. It's, well, on the, what was it, the Saturday or Sunday, I forget which day, but there was a tremendous amount of wind. Saturday was and, very windy. Yeah. And so I went out um, on Maycox Bay, which is a protected bay. Um, and went out windsurfing, and wow, did I go fast. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. Miracle you came back. <laughs> Was it choppy? <laughs> well, that's the great thing about Maycox Bay is it's protected oh, water, okay. yeah. so it was very smooth, but then there were, I don't know, 20-plus knots of wind just as a baseline, and then you would get these gusts. So it was very shifty, and when the gusts would come, as long as you were ready for them and dropped back to really um, be in the right position, that board would just pop up on a plane and it would fly so i had a mm. lot of fun this is a windsurfing a windsurfer right? you didn't go out on a boat no no yeah i went down and took the mast down and tied the boat down everybody was pulling their boats on saturday it was pretty windy um but then it stopped blowing on sunday they had races at the yacht club yeah, yeah. yeah. it's all in the yeah. bay it's protected but it was still very windy but uh, now i mean this thing is still offshore you can tell by the nasty sky and it's pretty windy around here, but, you know, I live inland somewhat in New Jersey. It's sunny. There's no wind. It's very different. I was hoping that it would bring some rain to this area, but it didn't. How long is this thing going to sit out there? It could be out there for another week. It's, since it's over the ocean, it's gain, it gets energy, right, from yeah. the Yeah, and there's a, the it's stalled because there's no front coming through to push it out. I see. So it's like a nor'easter that does, doesn't give up. But fortunately, we were able to make it here for uh, this week in Paris. Oh, yeah, we, we, we could weather the storm. It. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't show up on the weather map anymore. No, Maybe it's it probably away. just a cyclonic flow of air right now rather than a... a cyclonic flow of air. What a name. an organized system of <laughs> heat sucking. What is a cyclone? Isn't it's that, another name for a hurricane. Yeah, in a different part of the world, right? Yeah, it's in the uh, Pacific. And a monsoon is another word for and a hurricane. A typhoon is another word for Is it a monsoon also? Or is it no, a, no, monsoon is a season. It's when the rainy season starts. Monsoon is a season. Gorilla monsoon. <laughs> I think, isn't it that hurricanes and typhoons are defined by wind speeds? You have to be above 70 miles per hour. You do, and they're cyclonic. Miles per hour. They're, they're all monsoon cyclonic. is not a season. It's a seasonally, seasonal reversing <laughs> wind accompanied by changes in precipitation. That's traditionally, but it's now used to describe seasonal changes in atmospheric circulation and precipitation associated with the asymmetric heating of land and sea. Well, I was close. <laughs> the more we know, the harder it gets to explain what a word means, right? Exactly right. <laughs> you want precision? Do you, think this is you, a remember, show? you remember Gorilla Monsoon? <laughs> Sorry? This is a science show. No right? idea what Gorilla Monsoon You have no idea? I don't. Where have I you don't. been? I don't know what that All right. means. Let's go back to... Wait, wait, wait. wait. What does it mean? <laughs> it was a person. It used to be... You know that fake wrestling that they do? Oh. What is that called? It's called wrestling. <laughs> well, there's real wrestling, you know, Olympic and stuff. No, no, this is like show it's wrestling. It's a fake show. It used to be one of those. Gorgeous George. When I was a kid, my grandfather, who was an immigrant, loved it for some reason. Oh, it was on television. And That's he used why. to take me to actually take me to the garden to You're see kidding. actual shows You're until I said, I don't want to see this anymore. But 
One of the <laughs> wrestlers was Gorilla Monsoon. He was a bad. They were bad guys and good guys. Oh, absolutely right. It's still going on, unfortunately. Yeah, he loved to go watch this. I don't know why. He was such a mild guy, and he used to go yeah, watch it. It's very popular. It was all fake. Yeah. All right. Let's go back to TWIP 115 and review our case from this that episode. This is a stumper. A stumper. Okay. <laughs> Stump the stars. Well, I will say, having looked ahead at the emails, that some people got this right. So you know, let me... Let me remind those um, who listened last time and acquaint those who are tuning in for the first time that this was, I described as a more challenging case than Mm -hmm. um, the previous one. And I did say that there was a better outcome than last time. Right. Uh, The case was that of a 32-year-old man from Thailand, a Thai man from the southern coastal part of the country. And he came into the infectious disease hospital in Bangkok with two months of watery diarrhea. Rapid onset, he looked emaciated, he had a protuberant um, belly. He was having diarrhea 10 times per day um, and reporting that he was actually having trouble flushing the toilet. Um, He eats normal Thai fare, boat noodles, fish, rice, vegetables, um, som tam, sort of typical um, Thai dishes. <clears throat> he likes some time with salted crab. Um, we did mention, give people a sense that a lot of the salted crab and other dishes here are not well cooked. Um, no unusual past medical history. He had been a healthy fisherman prior to this on no medication. He's married with kids. Um, everyone else is healthy. Um, no toxic habits. Not a smoker, not a drinker. Um, he's monogamous, HIV negative. His liver, spleen were not enlarged. Um, And then we did find out that he had an abdominal x-ray, which showed um, a loss of intestinal villi. Um, He says he has good appetite. He's been eating a lot but and having no abdominal pain. But he has gotten to the point where he's too weak to work, and he comes in for medical care. Hmm. All right. Our first guest was from Mike. I was first considering... Giardia, but Daniel mentioned it in his description, so I am now leaning toward tropical sprue causing the flattening of intestinal villi, steatorrhea, and malnutrition. Cause unknown, question mark. Happy sailing, Mike in Oregon. (laughs) (laughs) They do a lot of sailing in Oregon. That's good. (laughs) What is tropical sprue, Daniel? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if we use that quite as, quite as much anymore. And it was sort of the idea of a, of an overgrowth. I don't. Was it something you even taught about in your courses? Well, yeah, we had uh, two forms of sprue, non-tropical and tropical, <laughs> <laughs> and they were both associated with um, malabsorption syndrome in the tropics, mm. or not, depending on where you where you acquired it. Is but it, is the it causative infectious? agent... It's not infectious, is it? Well, that was the question at, 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 uh, yeah. at hand at the, in those days. They wanted to know what did cause tropical sprue. They thought it might have been due to some filarial parasites, but I think that's been dispelled. Yeah, I don't think we actually, no, I don't think I've ever come across a good explanation, but we seem to see less of it. So it may be that it was sort of a grab bag of other things, and now that we identify other things and treat them, you know, could this have one, you know, in the past have fallen into that grab bag before we knew what it was? Well, and it's associated with eosinophilia, (laughs) so that was another reason for thinking that it might be caused by a helminth, but that hadn't, that has not been borne out by the evidence. Yeah, but it was. I mean, it goes back to the 1800s. Yeah, it's absolutely. a malabsorptive diarrhea, so it, it okay. sort of fits right. with this. Right. But it doesn't really give us a, an actual diagnosis, I would no. say. It's sort of a grab bag, tropical acquired malabsorptive exactly. diarrhea. Exactly. Yeah. Daniel. Wink writes, if Dixon was advised to look this one up, I certainly <laughs> had to. I came up with capillariasis. C. philippinensis is not uncommon in the Philippines and Thailand. Humans acquire the parasite through ingestion of raw freshwater fish, as with koi pla. Adult C. philippinensis worms in humans can release eggs that hatch into larvae in the intestine and cause hyperinfection and possibly voluminous stools and wasting. Albendazole can be curative. Wink Weinberg. Right. And uh, I don't know if we'll get a chance to discuss C. philippinensis further. But that's one of the interesting things about C. philippinensis is like strongyloides, you can actually get this hyperinfection cycle. That's right. 
I mean, we normally think with parasites, you get, you know, let's say you get 10 parasites, you you have 10 parasites because they need to leave you to create the, to complete their life cycle. Strongyloides, C. philippinensis, mm -hmm. in a host, you can get one, two, I guess you probably need two. <laughs> and, uh, and then next thing you know, a hundred, a thousand. So you can get a hyper infection. Right. Dixon. Um, David writes, dear esteemed doctors, I did not write in last week, but I did guess correctly that the patient had contracted Neglaria phalari. My condolences to the family. As for the case of the Thai fisherman struck with bouts of diarrhea, I believe this man has contracted a case of opostorchiasis caused by the Southeast Asian liver fluke Opostorchus viverini. A quick Google search and some research led me to sources that connected many Thai and Laotian dishes featuring raw fish, koi pla, pla ra, and some tam, with liver fluke disease. This disease is contracted by humans consuming raw fish infected with the metasicaria of the fluke. The metasicaria exist in the duodenum and ascends through the ampulla of vata into the biliary ducts of the liver where the parasites attach and mature. The adults lay eggs after three to four weeks, which are passed <clears throat> excuse me, in the feces and consumed by the primary intermediate host, a snail. Pardon me again. The myricidia hatch in the, sm in the snail and eventually develop into sicariae, which leave the snail and seek freshwater fish, the secondary intermediate host. In the muscles or under the scales of the fish, the sicariae insist into their metasicarial stage, which are then consumed by their fishy hosts, by definitive host mammalian cats, cats, dogs, humans, and thus the life cycle is complete. Diagnosis should be confirmed by examining the stool for eggs or performing an ELISA, on an 89 KDA antigen of the parasite, and treatment includes antihelminthic praziquantel. The first week of graduate school has been fair, but I am chomping at the bit to get in the lab and start tinkering with those schistosomes. Mm -hmm. Best wishes, David P. P.S. The answer to the question to the lyric, so come up to the lab and see what's <laughs> on the slab, this line was immortalized with a great Tim Curry in the cult movie musical Rocky Horror Picture Show written by Richard O'Brien. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Dixon, the ampulla of Vader, Darth Vader? V Vada. It's called Vada, but it looks like Vader. <laughs> <laughs> it's, where the, it's where the pancreatic uh, secretions come out. Otherwise, you won't be able to digest your food. Steve writes, salutations, twiptoids. Our case of the Thai fisherman with chronic diarrhea is a tough one. My first guess, based on... Dixon's Uncertainty. <laughs> what a good name for a podcast. Dixon's Uncertainty. <laughs> could cover so many different topics. <laughs> and Daniel's statement that it would take some research is cystoisosporiasis caused by C. belly. C. belly. Come C. belly. I diverge. It is unusual but not unheard of for this protozoa to cause chronic disease in immunocompetent patients. Infection comes from exposure to contaminated food or water. The patient's family may ha well have had asymptomatic or mild symptoms, which would explain why he reported them to be healthy. Symptoms include profuse, watery, non-bloody, offensive-smelling diarrhea, which may contain mucus, foul-smelling flatus, cramping, abdominal pain, vomiting, nausea and vomiting are uncommon, malaise, anorexia, weight loss, low-grade fever, Steatorrhea in protracted cases, myalgias rare, headache rare. Diagnosis can be confirmed with a stool examination for ova and parasites. This would be a good first choice. Since we are trying to minimize the number of unnecessary tests, this can rule out many other potential parasitic infections as well. If possible, a stool culture to look for unusual enteric bacterial pathogens and fecal leukocyte exam would also be useful. Treatment is usually sulfamexazole, Sorry, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Differential is extensive. Cyclospora would be a good second likelihood, and the lab should be notified to look for a cyclospora of oocysts when performing the ONP. Dianthamoeba fragilis usually does not present with steatorrhea and is negative radiologically. Chiardiasis and cryptosporidiosis can be ruled out with a simple immunoassay, but we might want to wait since the symptoms would not be normal for either condition. Multiple bacterial infections are possible, though these don't usually last this long. I'm looking forward to the big reveal. 
I'm not as certain <laughs> about this as I was about last episode's unfortunate case, but either way, I will enjoy finding out the answer. Cool mornings and hot afternoons in the eastern Sierra. School is now in full swing, and we are hitting the tail end of the diarrhea season here <laughs> in the clinical lab. <laughs> We had our several cases of relapsing fever that we seem to get every summer, oh. so our Borrelia species appear to be thriving in our tick population. No Lyme so far to my knowledge, so probably Hermsi or Recurrentis. Soon, we will be back to Strep A and influenza before you know it. <laughs> Take care and keep up the great work, Steve. Hmm. And Yosef writes, Dear Twip Trio, I don't have a... Def- Definite diagnosis for this case, but I'll try to do my best. <clears throat> my primary diagnosis is intestinal capillariasis caused by Capillaria philippinensis. They were discovered in the Philippines, hence their name, but are fairly prevalent in other parts of the world, such as Thailand. While birds are usually the definitive hosts for these nematodes, sometimes humans can be used instead. The adult female worm can lay eggs within the GI tract that can either be excreted in the stool or mature within the tract, and reinvade and reinfect the definitive host. This may explain why our fisherman is not getting any better. Symptoms include abdominal pain, weight loss, diarrhea, anemia, and hypoalbuminemia. Steatorrhea is less common, but still occurs regularly enough that it doesn't rule out the diagnosis. Other secondary diagnoses. Cholangiocarcinoma from chronic Opus thorcus viverini clinorcus sinensis infection. Liver flukes are often asymptomatic themselves, but can become very symptomatic if a cancer sets in. Chronic infection with a liver fluke can irritate the bile ducts and eventually result in a cholangiocarcinoma. This could result in weight loss, fatigue, and malaise. If the bile ducts were obstructed, then a steatorrhea could develop with a fat malabsorption. However, I doubt this diagnosis because the patient is not complaining of any right upper quadrant pain. Jaundice, darkened urine, or light colored stools are also not mentioned. A severe ascaris infection could also obstruct the biliary tree via their huge mass. There would also be a significant anemia at this point from the significant amount of blood being lost by the parasites. Again, this diagnosis is unlikely because there's no mention of respiratory complaints, although this is not always present, or an obstructive type of picture. An anisocus infection could also cause an obstruction if it formed a granuloma around the sphincter of OD. This again, unlikely from the lack of an obstructive picture and possible pancreatitis that would result. For diagnosis, a stool, O and P, stool OVA and parasites, would need to be done to look for eggs of these various parasites. For capillaria, I know that the stool OVA often come up negative. Ova, I'm sorry to jump right <laughs> in there, but it's really should be OVA. Did I just pronounce like it OVA? eggs, yes. Yeah. <laughs> A stool, ovum, and parasites That's it. often come up negative, and an EGD is done to look for the parasites directly. But I don't know if this is available to the clinic within Thailand. Other exams that may help narrow the differential would be physical exam findings. How old is the patient? Clangiocarcinoma is less likely if he is in his 20s. Is there any jaundice, pruritus, any abdominal findings, any eosinophilia if available? Once again, thank you for a thought-provoking case. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff, Hofstra School of Medicine, class of 2018. Mm-hmm. So. <clears throat> no, that's it. There's no that's, more. That's it. So now we can discuss well, it. We had two capillarias, and then we had a couple of other things. Right. Interesting. Right. All right, Daniel, what do we have here? Uh, what else? Laboratory <laughs> leaders. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, like some people suggested, we went ahead and we did an OVA. <laughs> An no. OVA. What does it stand for? No, Nathan? it's OVA. It's a, what are the three words it stands for? No, it's not. No. It's, it's mispr- misprinted. Yeah, I'm not sure why it was capital O, V, and A, but you know, we'll give Yosef a hard time because he actually does quite a good job. So, you know, he, he's risen to the level where I think we can give him a hard time and, well, and a, he will that's take an it a in minus. stride. I mean, he got an A minus. He was just off by a little bit. Ovid parasites, that's what the test is called. Just test for ovid parasites. Well, he, we, we, you know, basically this gentleman had diagnostic testing and the first diagnostic test with this story, which I think a few of our emailers um, yeah. sort of picked up on. This was actually fairly characteristic of a capillaria philippinensis infection. Right. And so eggs were actually seen in the stool. Hmm. Here, here. 
And they're, Wait, you know, so you see eggs, but how do you know they're capillaria eggs? Oh, oh they have a characteristic morphology. As actually. with the viruses and their capsids, all the eggs can be differentiated from each other, including capillaria. Well, not all viruses can be differentiated from each other based on the capsid. The groups, the groups can. <laughs> they can be categorized into groups, yes, right? Yes, but you could see a, so this is a, a capillary virus, and it could be polio, and anthro, no, no, right. sure, blah, blah, sure, blah. It could be sure, many things. Sure, sure, sure. But this actually, seems very specific. Yeah. No, actually, you, you bring up a good point. Let's mm. look at our um, Artenia species, right? That's right. Yeah, and you, um, you know, in general, under light microscopy, you can't tell uh, Tenia saginata from uh, mm -hmm. Tenia solium. And it's actually quite important to know because the tenia okay. saginata is fairly benign, right? Yeah. While the tenia solium, so your pork egg worm, <laughs> your pork tapeworm, as opposed to your beef tapeworm, right. um, the pork tapeworm can cause problems. Uh, we, we think about 10% of people that get invasive, like neurocystosarcosis, um, we'll say, you know, basically extra intestinal um, forms. Um, probably auto infect. They probably started off with a tapeworm in themselves, mm -hmm. and then they didn't wash their hands, and then they touched something, and then it ended up in their own mouth, and then they infected yeah. themselves by ingesting the eggs. So, um, even though the eggs of those two look almost exactly the same, I would say an indistinguishable under light microscopy, there are certain tricks you do. Like in that case, you can acid fast stain. Okay. And one will acid fast stain positive, the other won't. Um, or you can now do molecular testing. So uh, they have antibodies. That'll yeah, they have antibodies so. now. But the eggs in the stool are they indistinguishable under yeah. the microscope? You can't from tell what? them apart from, from each other. The tenia solium. Those tenia tenias sagenata. you can't tell apart. What about the capillaria? Yeah, you can. Now capillaria has more distinctive eggs. So you can say so this is capillaria species. for sure. Right, there's capillaria. What's hepatica? distinct about the eggs? By You'll the way. see right here. Well, he yeah, our, our people can't see. You got to describe it for. All right. <laughs> Let's describe it as follows. It has a smooth outer eggshell, mm -hmm. and it has two pores as seen at the end of each end of the egg. And they're covered with a little cap. And the inside of the egg that has striations on the inside of the uh, shell, mm -hmm. which also typifies it as a capillaria egg. But you could say, well, is that capillaria philippinensis or is it capillaria hepatica? Because those two eggs are very close to each other. Yeah. All right, yeah. but capillary hepatica, as its name implies, lives in the liver, and it usually does not infect people. Although there have been rare cases, capillary philippinensis. I knew the man who was responsible for describing the life cycle. Who's that? Uh, his name was John Cross, mm -hmm. and he was in the navy at the time. And there was a naval base in Philippines called Subic Bay, as you might yes, recall. I remember that. And he was stationed there. Mm -hmm. He was at Namru. And Namru, I forget, Namru three, there were three, there were three altogether. There was one in Egypt, one in uh, the Philippines, and I forget where the other one was, but he was stationed in the Philippines, and he saw lots of these cases. And in the Philippines, as maybe the, with this Thai fisherman, the way they catch it is kind of unique, because, and this will astound some of the listeners, I'm sure, in the Philippines, there's a dish called jumping salad. Mm-hmm. What is jumping salad? Mm -hmm. And you can see restaurants that have these big circular signs out. We serve jumping salad. And I, and I will say they also served in Bangkok. The, the, <laughs> Thais, serve, the well, Thais have decided this is a great dish. They wanted to. And, and this is as fresh as it gets, by the way. It's in fact, jumping, it's alive. Because it's jumping. It's alive. It's filled with things. And these things are harvested with a net yeah. in an estuary, probably in a freshwater saltwater mix, mm -hmm. but mostly in an estuary where there's a lot of fecal contamination and there's a cycle that goes on in other animals too. It's a zoonotic infection. And so John Cross was <laughs> stumped by what the heck is going on here. And people die from this. It's really quite lethal. Yeah. So if you let that fisherman go any longer than this, he probably would have died of electrolyte imbalance and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, so he and I became very good friends. Um, the fisherman and you? No, no, no. John Cross. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. John too. Cross. He ended up at the um, at the uh, Usamrid, the hospital medical school complex at Bethesda, the Naval Medical Research, uh, and was the chief parasitologist there for many years. And I used to go down there and give a few lectures. And John and I were very close. He he was a wonderful guy. Actually, he was very, very uh, supportive. And his son. I mean, I'm I'm diverting a little bit, but it's good for people to know what these the background for some of this is his son was studying to be a priest at Notre Dame, hmm. which is where I got my PhD. And the reason why I mention this is that 
uh, tragedy struck in his family. He was his son was out for a walk one evening, and a car struck him and killed him. Hmm. He never uh, finished his studies, and when John found out that I got my degree at Notre Dame, I think that sort of brought us together and, and made us sort of bond in another way rather than just over parasites. So yeah. this is a nematode. This is a nematode. And it's very closely related, not to strongyloides, although it has some of the biological characteristics of auto-infection. It's more closely related to trichinella. All right. And when you look at this uh, group, it's pr- part of the, uh, the, the trichoroidea. Uh, it's got stichocytes. It gives birth to live larvae sometimes and sometimes to eggs. It depends on uh, how uh, active the host immune system is. It can actually force the parasite to stop producing live larvae and to start shedding eggs. And that's an interesting uh, twist on the biology of these uh, parasites. And how does the immune system regulate that function in a worm? It would be very unusual to find So you would acquire this by eating? Jumping, something raw. Undercook, raw fish. Something raw, yeah, yeah. Which you mentioned in your description last week. But it's not saltwater fish, it's freshwater. This is all freshwater stuff. But you mentioned he eats crabs uh, and He eats crab and the cloy pla, and basically he eats a lot of raw fish fish okay. crustaceans and what and, w- what form of the nematode would you would you be ingesting so ben you'd eat the eggs you'd be eat. eating the eggs now where are the fi- are these natural nematodes of fish well it's who's the dad who's the definitive host well <laughs> in this case we are but uh, because uh-huh. we're harboring the sexual stages and then we, we but usually it's but usually them. as described by some of our emailers it's it's going it's a fish bird fish bird All right. it's zoonotic it's so a, it gets in the birds they lay the eggs and then the, that's right so we ingest the eggs they go into our intestine they do what, they mature into adults they do and then they mate and make more eggs that's right, that's right. or larvae and first they start larvae, with larvae and as the immune system kicks in it forces them to start producing eggs. And we shed eggs, but then we have lots of worms in our intestine. We do. And that causes the diarrhea. That's correct. Got it. Capillaria philippensis. Philippinensis. Named after the Philippines. Philippinensis. That's Named right. The Philippines. Yeah, in a 1968 outbreak, over a thousand cases sure. in the Philippines, which doctors were hired to exercise the curse placed on them by the river god? Right. So in <laughs> Bangkok, Bangkok is a... It's not on the it's not on the coast. It's on a river. So this fisherman, I presume, was fishing in a freshwater situation, and that's how he got acquired. Fresh and maybe water. you know, munching out on some of the stuff that he caught before he brings it to the market to sell it. And by the way, that's says, uh, so, so. Somtom is a fish sauce made from raw fish. Is that correct? It is. Um, yeah, I'm actually just trying to. I wasn't sure whether or not it was the eggs or the infective larvae that that pass from the from the fish to humans just well when you're eating a bunch of (laughs) (laughs) jumping things in your salad can you imagine what that's like to just do that jumping salad jumping salad you can find a picture of it if you go to google images you can find it yeah because i'm thinking actually i might be wrong about this but i was actually that was an infective larvae that we ingest and well if you eat the fish uh, they have larvae in them right that's true yeah because the embry, because the eggs are unembryonated when they're shed by the uh, birds, and then the embryonate, you get an infective stage that's developing in the in the fish. But anyway, you you asked about somtom. By the way, yeah, and uh, somtom. Yeah, we should go through. I think when I was we were reading that, I thought we should discuss what are all these different dishes. So let me go up to which which that was one of our first emailers described these um, different dishes. Do you remember who that was? Here it was. Wink it was before. from uh, yeah. You described. Plo ka, he described. Wink described. Okay, so koi pla koi and pla. pla ra. Pla ra. What these are is <laughs> what they do. It's really interesting. I, um, Have you had them? Yes, of course. Um, one of the <laughs> did he get you know, some days you know people of, always people always ask me they're like, what, oh, you know, with this knowledge of parasitism, you must, you must eat nothing. I'm like, no, it's the opposite because I'm so curious. <laughs> then you just take so, drugs all the time. You know, I heard this story, and that night I went out to um, have some tom with salted crab because you know, I mean, I'm trying to figure out in some of these areas we have such high infection rates. Why would they keep eating this stuff? And so I need to experience Is that. Good. It's that good. It's so good. <laughs> and so uh, uh. the um, the koi pla and the pla ra, um, they take fish and they, they basically ferment it. It's two different ways of fermenting it, either with mm. lime juice or other fermented ways of um, sort of curing the fish. Um, 
you know, I guess in a perfect world, what would you do? You drop in liquid nitrogen first and kill things, and then you do the <laughs> fermenting. World, is- but I'm not sure there's a lot of tanks of liquid nitrogen out there in these areas. But um, yeah. yeah, and then somtam is it, it does it usually has a fish. It's a raw fish sauce, and that's the problem. Is in that sauce you can get infected larvae, you can get eggs, and then you put this fish sauce. People are like, oh, try the fish sauce. And I'm thinking that's the most dangerous part of the dish is the, <laughs> so the okay, fish sauce. <laughs> we pour that I'll on. Two. <laughs> yeah, so either the dish itself. And why do they do this? You know, we talked about the monsoons before when everything is wet and rainy. Mm. How do you cook mm. your fish? How are you going to cook your foods? So I, I'm trying to figure out how this sort of developed. But um, a lot of times during the heavy rainy seasons, they will just take their fish and they'll soak it in lime juice and other citrusy type mm. acidic like juices. Type yeah, exactly. And then they'll eat it because it's been cured. And, you know, it's really tough because so many people are being infected. How do you sort out what you're doing that you shouldn't do and et cetera? Um, but I will say sometimes it's really great, great stuff. <laughs> you have eclectic tastes. <laughs> is, uh, is this a endemic or epidemic type of disease? It is um, incredibly common, the number They're of people gone. that get exposed. The, the problem I think we saw in this case was something was special about this man. You know, everyone's having these heavy exposures, but he somehow was developing this auto-infection and increase in the parasite burden. And that's what really put you at, like, why was this not one of the other things mentioned? And it was how incredibly ill this man was becoming. So either he was constantly ingesting more parasites or the parasite had some ability to replicate and, and become mm-hmm. more of a problem. And I, and I think that was what, you know, sort of pushes things towards this being a case of capillaria philippinensis. Did you ever see this in your career, Dixon? No, I didn't. No, no, I think it's endemic to the uh, South Pacific. Yes, but you can imagine someone might fly here after having eaten and Never develop saw, it here. Never, Never saw one here in New no, York they're City. they're so sick, I don't think they fly very well, to be honest with you. <laughs> And the actual parasite is not found around here, so you would never find it in fish here, shellfish. That is correct. And and remember, this is fresh water. This has to be fresh water. Southeast Asia. Not not salt water. Southeast Asia. Yeah. Okay. And the Philippines. Yeah. Got it. It's interesting. There haven't been a lot of cases of this reported in travelers, other than there were some cases in Italy and Spain. Mm -hmm. But as Dixon points out, it's not really a, a problem in travelers. No. Um which is why I didn't need to worry. <laughs> <laughs> if you become infected by the larva, it's very much like trichinella then because that's actually how it starts too. So you've got some parallels there. Yeah. Do these ever leave the intestine? No, they don't. And that is the, uh, that is the difference. Hmm. The worms stay within the intestinal tract. They don't go outside. Which intestine, the large or the small? I think it's the small. You know, and I think that that's... Whereas capillary hepatica does go outside. Yeah, and I think um, that's sort of the thing to think about. When we think about infections, where was this infection localizing? And it wasn't wasn't localizing in the liver. It wasn't localizing Mm -hmm. the biliary tree. Though I sort of, you know, people put together a story about. um, So it's it's really localizing in the intestines. Mm -hmm. So the other worms related to it, trichinella, capillaria, trichosomoides, which Mm -hmm. infects the the, uh, the epithelial lining of the bladder. It's particularly in rats. And then Trichuris. Trichuris is a relative of this group as well. So they're all mm-hmm. part of the same large right. nematode family. So Dan, and as, uh, as mentioned, it's, a, it's small intestine, right? We saw the yeah. villi flattening, the That's malabsorption. Right. Um, because we, we absorb, sort of a little physiology aside, we absorb our nutrients in the small intestine. Mm-hmm. We reabsorb the water mm-hmm. in the large intestine. So the okay. large intestine is basically drying out our stool. Small intestine is doing um, most of the digestion. So think about it. It makes sense. You add a lot of secretions. You add fluid. You mix it up. You absorb what you need to. And then you don't want to just have watery stuff coming out. So large intestine is going to concentrate it. So you could sometimes, depending on the type of diarrhea, you get a sense like Giardia. Where's Giardia is going to cause a malabsorption? Where is that going to infect? Small intestine. Yeah. So you could sort of think through what's going on and it helps you. All right. So last night I gave a lecture at (laughs) Cornell. Right. Right, how'd Wild that go? Cornell right. Medical College. It was very good. Basic virology to infectious disease physicians. Oh, excellent. And one of them <laughs> came up to me afterward, uh, a, an infectious disease doc, uh, who's, and she said to me, I don't have a colon. Can I still get norovirus, rotavirus, <gasps> and adenovirus, gastro, enteritis? <laughs> My goodness, what'd you tell her? <laughs> well, I said the colon is where water is reabsorbed. So you can imagine that... Uh, 
that must be the target for these viruses that cause diarrhea. However, I'm hearing from you that it could also be the small intestine that you have a absorption defect caused by a, by a parasite and that leads to diarrhea. Rotavirus. Is yeah, the I mean the, the thing yeah, I mean the interesting thing is that um, you can have diarrhea because you're failing to absorb the water or you're secreting more water. Yeah, but in this yeah. case, they're having diarrhea because they're failing to absorb fats and nutrients. So it's a yeah, yeah. osmotic or a lipid, which happens in the small intestine. Exactly. But that's interesting. I don't know. Do you, what was the answer? <laughs> well, I, I thought that these were all cases of not absorbing water, in which I, in which case I said it's the large intestine. So you might get infected. Maybe these viruses can also replicate in the small intestine, but you shouldn't have any diarrhea because mm-hmm. you don't have a colon. But I said I would research it and, and let her know. <laughs> dear, dear. She gave me her card, <laughs> and she wrote it. Nice. A, no colon to remind me who it was. <laughs> No colon. She said, I'm the healthiest person on the planet. <laughs> so take your colon out, Dixon. I don't think so. Right now. I feel very healthy and like I am. Thank you. <laughs> How did you treat this yeah. gentleman? Let me ask what I just, I'm <laughs> fascinated by this. I mean, that was a great question wait, this wait, woman wait, asked. <laughs> okay. now, now, with norovirus, there's vomiting. So I'm thinking there has to be some higher up um, phenomenon going on, right? Because you a colitis wouldn't trigger you to vomit. You know, some of the criteria no. for the norovirus, um, you know, the winter vomiting mm-hmm. syndrome is that so it has to be. I'm I'm just thinking she could still get um, norovirus. But what about Ro- anyway, how do we treat well, this? Well, can, so the the vomiting is we don't know exactly, but it's probably caused by stimulation of the enteric nervous system by viral proteins, right? Yeah, and that could happen in the small intestine as well as that's the, what I was thinking. Yeah, colon. So so she may have. Vomiting, but no, no diarrhea. It's an, it's, people must have looked at this because there are enough people without colons. Yeah. I mean, entire colon. It's actually right? true. Yeah, the whole colon. Yeah. Wow, it's interesting. Um, so this patient was treated. Um, y- you have choices. You could do bendazole, albendazole, one of the bendazole drugs. Yeah, you did. Oh, the stool. Oh, you did. You said did. okay. You looked at the stool. Okay. OVA, capital letters. <laughs> <laughs> what about Remember the eosinophilia? You did blood work too. No, actually, this person didn't get no blood, blood work. work. Oh, okay. uh, it was seen in the stool. Patient was immediately right. treated. Um, with Mabendazole for actually three weeks. It's a 20-day, three-week course, and person did great. Right. Excellent. Um, yeah, now, still we'll, doesn't explain why he had, you know, there's probably a genetic propensity yes, here, sure. or, or maybe just some incredible amounts of exposure, right? He's a fisherman. Well, sure. Just hanging out, so snacking. Eating, snacking. Now, okay. can he be infected again? Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't know. Good question. Yeah, I'm not sure that you develop any kind of um, protective uh-huh. immunity. But Rita Colwell, who you may know from other worlds, uh, once gave a talk here and described very well how the cholera outbreaks start. And indeed, it starts, you know, after the monsoons have flooded the estuary and decreased the salt so that the bacteria now can hatch from their little cysts, from their spores, I should say, or their resting stage. They don't even know what it is. I think cholera has a resting stage, but they don't know what to call it. It's not like the bacillus... um, group in the clostridia group that actually have true spores, but but it, they cause them to develop into the vegetative stage, let's say. And they then grow to confluence in all of this nutrient solution that's coming down from the rivers. And as the result of a bloom of phytoplankton, there's a subsequent bloom of zooplankton. And this zooplankton has crustaceans as part of their makeup. And cholera organisms actually coat the egg sacs of these crustaceans and secrete a chitinase at a specific moment in time during the egg development, which allows the eggs to be released from the crustaceans. And that's their true biological role. That's what they do for a living. And <laughs> and so if you're going to you catch sure about all this, you sure about all this? Rita was very sure. Yes, Rita was a long time ago, Dixon. No, no, no. Rita had lots of backup a on this. A long time ago. Yeah, but she had lots Better of backup. be back- careful. She you had backup. She had, it's on my medical ecology website. Did you have a Drobo? Website. Did you have a Drobo? <laughs> <laughs> so your medical ecology website is at least 20 years old. That's true. But this was known since then. All right. So the, what I'm trying to raise here yeah, what is are the you same issue for catching capillariasis occurs when people catch cholera. They harvest this bonanza of food in the estuary during the -hmm. the, the waning monsoon, and they're bringing all this food back to home, and sometimes they're a week away from home. Are you saying that the capillarensis has something to do with storms? No. 
Okay, so but that's what you just said, actually. No, I'm just, <laughs> so no, I don't want to say, say that. Just because, cut all this out. No, what I want to. No, you don't have to cut it out. You. What I'm trying to say is they both start from ingesting estuary-based food raw. Yeah. Okay. Now it's actually. I think. I think you know the important point I would sort of pull out of this is that you're often better ingesting things from salt water. It's the fresh water and that brackish water. Really, you know, it, it's a perfect place for a lot of things to grow and particularly things that like to grow there and then ultimately infect us. That's true. Are there parasites of fresh, of saltwater fish? Well, the anisakids are all saltwater yeah. fish. Yeah. Sure. Saltwater. That's right. What kind of really they the, don't complete their life. But it's really the yeah. fresh water stuff that gets us gotcha. in trouble. So when traveling, right. don't swim in the fresh water. <laughs> Ignore all those pictures of me and my family in Lake Malawi. <laughs> uh, try not to eat freshwater fish and right. crustaceans. Again, ignore all those pictures and stories. <laughs> Dixon, just just stay home. <laughs> That's boring. <laughs> boring. You want to be alive or dead? Alive and bored or dead? If I were to put a pin in the world where my wife and I have traveled to and the things that we've eaten there, you'd swear I'd be dead 20 years ago. It's your next, and now a lot of people would think I am dead 20 years ago. Your next trip is going to get you. Anything else we need to know about this? No, no. That's I hope it. people enjoyed that case. Wonderful. Right. All right. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. Dixon, what is a streaming service? <laughs> <sighs> Don't do this to me. Every time you ask me and every time I forget. Okay, forget it. I won't ask you. <laughs> they have over 1,500 titles in six hours. 600 Hours of Content, founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. And that means you're going to get real science shows, not reality TV and nonfiction, which plagues the cable. You can get it on many platforms. So here's why it's streaming. You go to the web and you log into their site. You click play and it will stream to you. You can watch it. It doesn't download it. It just gives so you what So that's what, what a stream need. is. Yeah, streaming means you don't download it and then play it. I gotcha. You can also play it on a number of platforms like Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon, Fire, Kindle, and Apple TV. It's available in 196 countries. Probably Thailand is one of them because 196, but who knows. Wide variety of science, technology, nature, history, interviews, lectures, documentaries. The key is it's all nonfiction. It's not made up. It's science-based. For example, Stephen Hawking's Universe a series where he traces the history of astronomical theories and technology. Deep Time History, which is about the universe's 14 billion year history and underwater wonders of the national parks. This is the 100th anniversary of the national park system here in the U.S. In this series, it's seven parts. Take you on a journey below the bodies of water. If you ever wanted to wow. go below the bodies of water, here you go. Here's your chance. You can see what, what kind of infections you'll pick up there, Dixon. <laughs> And they have one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries on the internet, over 50 hours of 4K, which is ultra high definition. So you can see all the defects in people and the environment, of course. They do have monthly and annual plans. You have to pay for this, of course. But they start at only $2.99 a month. We'd like a cup of coffee, less than a cup of coffee, <laughs> or one movie if you buy it on a competing platform. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up and you will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIP. Twip meaning, what does Twip mean, Dick? Uh, it means it's streaming. <laughs> no, it's, this ah, you have, week in. You have a sense of humor. <laughs> Parasitism. A paper. No, I can give you the wrong answers to any question have, you ask. We have a very interesting paper for you today. We do. Published in Nature, proteasome inhibition for treatment of leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, and sleeping sickness. Wow, all three. ton of authors, the first being Shilpikare, and the last author, Frantisek Supek. And these individuals are from lots and lots of places, including the Novartis Research Foundation in San Diego, the Wellcome Trust, which is over in Glasgow, uh, the Center for Immunology and Infection at the University of York, Department of Medicine at the University of Washington, which we affectionately call UW here in the U.S., That's right. and the Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases in Singapore. Now, 
these uh, three infections or diseases, Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, and sleeping sickness, they affect a lot of people, Dixon. They do. 20 million people worldwide and 50,000 deaths annually. That's right. But they all have one thing in common. Tell me what they have in common. Well, they have something called a kinetoplast. What is a kinetoplast? A kinetoplast is a <laughs> it's the largest extranuclear source of DNA that any organism can possess. It's larger than the centri- centromere, which also has a little bit of DNA in it. Kinetoplast. Or the mitochondria, which has a little it, bit more of DNA. The kinetoplast has DNA. Huh? Did you say the kinetoplast has DNA? It does. Where is it located in these organisms? Uh, it's located extranuclear. In some cases, it's located at the front end of the organism where the flagella exits. Mm-hmm. And in other cases, it's not because they don't have a flagellum, like, for instance, the Leishmania that live inside cells. Is it like a mitochondrion? It has some mitochondrial-like functions mm-hmm. in the maxi circles, not in the mini circles all of right. DNA. And they're all intercalated. They're twisted in some weird form. When you look at them under an electron microscope, they exhibit bizarre symmetries. And they've been the subject for a study for a very long time. Right. And uh, they've been deciphered. They have been deciphered. So the DNAs in the maxi circles encode for proteins, which have some resemblance to a mitochondria-like function. Mm-hmm. And the mini circles are all guide RNAs mm-hmm. for uh, completing the transcription of... Uh, all right. Well, what they say here, genome. Dixon, is that we need new drugs for these to treat these <laughs> right. diseases because so, the ones we have are not great. That's true. And uh, there's not a lot of money being put into new drug discovery. Would you agree with all of that? Absolutely. And so what they do here is they try and deal with that problem. They have three million compounds, which they go through three and say- Three million. Where, which of these three million <laughs> exactly. can inhibit the proliferation of these parasites? Right. And they go through every one of those three million by high throughput approaches. It's incredible. And they end up with one, which is an aza benzoxazole compound, right. which they call GNF5343. Right. It was identified as an inhibitor of Leishmania donovani and Trypanosoma brucei. Exactly. And then they say, does it inhibit T. cruzi? And it found. It did. Wow. One out of three million. Wow. You talk about luck. <laughs> now, luck had nothing to do with this thing. This was all... Uh... Luck favors the prepared mind. <laughs> no, this is not luck. This then they took this compound brute force. and gave it to the chemists. Yes, that's and right. And they said, make right. it better. That's right. And they modify it as chemists want to they do. Want they to put tame it. various groups on different places. They exactly. want to make it more potent. They, do. they want to reduce the toxicity, and this is for cells in culture, right. and they would like to make it more bioavailable, which means right. if you put it in the cell culture medium, it gets into the cells yep. themselves, and they do this, and this is why chemists reign supreme in pharmaceutical they do, companies. They do, they do, they do. Because they really make the final drug, and they end up with an, with a, a derivative of that original hit, which has right. got better of all of these Properties. Four yeah. hundred fold increase in intra macrophage L donabeni potency. Yep. So they really did a good job. And also here. bioavailability and less toxicity and so forth. To read the description of the add ons that they made and the takeoffs that they made, it's like it's it's fantastic. It, it's really quite amazing. This is what they do in pharma. The chemists modify compounds in, in rather standard ways. They put side groups onto the main molecule, and mm-hmm. then they simply ask, what do they do? They right. generate, and the key is, and I learned this by speaking with a number of chemists who work in industry, have a very high throughput pipeline where you can crank out lots of compounds so. and have mm-hmm. a fast assay so that you can look at them quickly. Because if, if she said to me once, uh, if you do five a week, you're screwed. You're never going to get anywhere. You got to do hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of modifications. You have to have good chemists and a good assay. Anyway, that's what pharma does well: high throughput screening. They didn't of do three million assays on the biology of this, did they? What are you talking about? Well, they, they did didn't three, screen three, three million. Drugs they did on three million them. proliferation assays. Yeah, and they so they've, they've got cut, these. Yeah, and then mon- they got, they've one got these. Yeah, okay. three eighty four well them? plates, and they've got yeah. as we now as you know thousands of these. And the, and it's all you know. Sometimes robots you can do them by structural and, analysis no, and this not was even. Screened. No, this was actually screened. So these were screened on live organisms. Yeah, proliferated. No, they were screened on, on dead organisms. organisms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then they got one play, hit play out nice, of three million. One hit. 
I just described this all, and he's asking me what they did. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Well, for those out there that aren't listening, to make he it was, better. Yeah, he, he was playing on his iPad. I saw him there. He's a little Pokemon Go, and You're he's hatching Pokemon an egg. Pokemon Go? No, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. How many Pokemon do you have? <laughs> don't, don't even ask. There are too many. And they're popping up but, in weird but Dixon, places. you got to catch them all. That's what I've been told. Anyway, then they went into mice. They went into mice. Mice infected with Leishmania Donovani. They gave them oral drug, and they got it. And they, they, they compare it to miltefosine. Is that the drug of choice, Dr. Griffin, for leishmania? <laughs> On for viscer, visceral leishmaniasis? You know, they. I, I don't think I would say drug of choice. It's it's the oral option. They're an basically option. after going, can we get the, an oral The only option? oral anti-leishmanial drug available. Yeah. And this outperformed miltefosine, which I guess is not a big deal because <laughs> miltefosine is not very good. But it, it was much better. <laughs> Pronounced reduction in parasite burden. Um Greater than three log reduction in parasite load after an eight-day treatment. That's amazing. Twice daily. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. And they noticed that the, the plasma concentrations of the drug in mice after oral administration correlated with yeah. its ability to reduce the liver parasite burden. Right? Makes sense. There you are. Then they go on to a model for cutaneous leishmaniasis. Yes. They, cute, cute little feet of the mouse. They put foot pad uh, parasites yeah. and you yeah. get a, yeah. a cutaneous disease there. They treat them with the drug. Five-fold decrease in foot pad parasite burden and a reduction in foot pad swelling. And they were superior. This drug was superior to miltefosine. Again. <laughs> then they looked at T. cruzi. Right. For which is benzidazole is broadly used for exactly. treatment, but it has side effects, they say. Lots of side many, effects. It's it really hard to get someone to complete a course. Yeah. I think we've talked about that. Yeah, it's Here, very no, poorly this, tolerated. Yes, program. So they infect mice with T. cruzi, and then 35 days after infection, um, they immunosuppress mice to make more parasites <laughs> in these mice, and then they dose them with the GNF6702 twice a day. And this matched the efficacy of benzidazole at, at a once daily, but there were no, and there were no parasites in the blood. Um, even in the immunosuppressed mice. Yeah. So this works very well. And then they have a model, a mouse model of stage two sleeping sickness. It's an interesting model. Does the mice fall asleep, Dixon? Yes. And get lethargic. <laughs> so this oh, is, I'm uh, sorry. Did you... <laughs> this, okay. this is when the parasites invade the CNS. Uh, and after you infect mice, 21 days later, they establish a CNS infection. They give them the drug once daily, and uh, they compare it to diminazine acetyrate, which is a drug that's not really good at getting into the brain. Right. Um, this cleared uh, the parasites in the blood, but they came back 21 days later. In contrast, their new drug, uh, they got clearance of parasites and no, no parasites in the brain. They didn't come back. So it's better than the existing drug. So here we have four kinetoplastid infections, visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, and sleeping sickness. So they said, since they're all kinetoplastid-containing species, maybe yeah, the sense. drug targets something in the kinetoplast, right? Maybe. So they tried to identify the target. How would you do that, Daniel? This is my favorite part of the article. By actually, selecting for say. mutants, right? I and then you ask, great. where's the mutation? Yeah. So they tried to do this for 12 months <laughs> with <laughs> Leishmania, and they got no drug resistance. So they grow the, the Leishmania for 12 months in the presence of the drug, no resistance, which is phenomenal, isn't it? I would say. But they could get drug-resistant uh, T. cruzi. They got two drug resistance. Two drug resistance, one resistant to two of their drugs, mm -hmm. uh, the final drug and, and an intermediate. Um, and they have a mutation, both resistant lines to GNF3943 we have a mutation which causes a single amino acid change from isoleucine uh, from methionine to isoleucine and amino acid 29 in the beta 4 subunit of the proteasome so now we get into what is the proteasome and they sub and they focus <laughs> right. their attention on the proteasome because they think that uh, that that's what it is the proteasome is a uh, a very large garbage disposal in the cell. Ubiquitin dependent. It's yes. a big assembly of many proteins right. whose job it is to degrade proteins that are marked for degradation by there ubiquitination, or they also 
uh, degrade foreign proteins that come in the cell so they can be generated into peptides that get displayed in uh, major histocompatibility proteins on the cell surface so the cells can be detected by the immune system. So really, really important, huge. It's a very large complex in uh, in not only these parasites, but in uh, us as well. We have yeah. proteasomes. We do. So and they, we're worried about therapeutic index. It's yeah. the result of that. And in us, it's key for cell survival. I mean, they use one of these, as we'll come across very soon, in treatment of certain malignancies. Huh. And, you know, I, I, you know, we always think of the cell as this static structure. But, you know, it's the Heraclides. It's the stream. It's a constant change, right? You always have proteins, new proteins. Heraclides. Remember Heraclides? Yeah, we were just talking about him yesterday, weren't we, Dixon? Yeah. We could talk about him today, too. So Heraclides <laughs> is, well, I'm sure our listeners know, he was the famous uh, Greek philosopher who said you can't step in the same river twice. Well, that's a, an alliteration of the is quote. That, but yeah. Yes, that was, I translated it. <laughs> <laughs> and Dixon and Heraclides were old friends. We were. You knew that. And, but Heraclides died. We I want to let you know, just in oh, case. No. Yes, he, he died. I don't want to come as a surprise to you. I haven't heard. I know no. you were close. What a shame. What a shame. Um, but no, the, the cell is constantly, you're constantly producing things, whether it's RNA or proteins, and then constantly degrading them. So you, you sit at a set point of what's there based upon what's being produced and what's being degraded. Sure. And the proteasome is really critical in degrading proteins. And in the case of the cancer issue, certain proteins are pro-survival and certain proteins are part of the program cell death pathway. There you go. And so they're using this to manipulate that balance in cancer cells. Right. Um, so we have to be careful here, right? Yep, We're, yep. We don't want to suddenly take someone with an infectious disease and put them on a high potency chemotherapeutic agent no. yep. that's going to cause cell death. So, as yeah, it's very important. Although that, a lot of the chemotherapeutic agents draw a fine line between killing off the cancer cell and killing off the We're host. We're getting better, though. We're getting much better. That's called the therapeutic yep. index. I yes. think maybe you should explain that for a moment. We're getting yeah, so, yeah, so the therapeutic index is the difference between achieving what you want to achieve and having side effects. And we set thresholds. You'll say, oh, this, this drug is, is very... Uh, actually, my wife and I were discussing this on a run this morning. Is that right? Yeah, this is a <laughs> new medicine. You know, they're looking at for migraines, and they say it's highly specific. Uh -huh. And so what we do is, when you want, let's say, 100% efficacy of a drug, well, there's this asymptote. So the closer you get, the more and more drug. So we, we find out, okay, this is 100% efficacy, but let's work in areas of about 50%, sort of on this, we say, the linear part of the curve. And to say something is specific, you then compare off-target effects, yeah. and you want those to be really, ideally, a thousand-fold. You have, to, you have <laughs> exactly. to increase the drug a thousand-fold before you really start seeing other effects. So in you know, mammalian cell death, when you're trying to kill a parasite. Yeah. So the therapeutic index is that gap between the dose that achieves what you want to achieve and the dose that achieves these off-target toxicities. Correct. You need to re read a review article on modern cancer treatments. It's totally different. Not as bad as 5-fluorouracil five, five and all that old stuff. There's immunotherapy and oh, targeted sure. oh, lysis good. with viruses delivering cargos. Precision medicine. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Love that term. But still, unfortunately, with the um, bortezomib, right, the proteasome inhibitor we use, we, we would often get called as infectious disease doctors because – not only does it take out the cancer, but it takes out any highly yeah. proliferating cells like our immune cells. They'll end up right. with infections. And Bone marrow cells that make red cells. Now, cells. there are inhibitors of the proteasome. I have one in my laboratory down the hall. We could go get it if you'd like. It's called MG132. And another one's called bortezomib. Mib? And Is that the antibody? Bortezomib, No. It's not an antibody. It's a MIB versus a MAB. A MAB remember we, ran, an remember we embarrassed ourselves in public? <laughs> Let's not well, do that again. A MIB is a small molecule. A MIB is a small molecule, right? So the AB, the AB is the antibody, antibody and the yeah. IB is going to target usually a kinase, These, right? We, yeah. Uh, did we say they were kinase inhibitors? Let's, let's, let's look it let's up. Let's not Bor, embarrass ourselves. Yes, let's. Bortezomib, or whatever it's called. I'll get it correct. And Bortezomib. Um, here we go. And one of them is called Velcade, which is a brand. Uh, what is this for? Multiple myeloma. And mantle cell lymphoma. Um, and so this is going to block, um, I think we actually know what. You know, our activity. pharmacy friend, uh, did write us about this. <laughs> 
Is it like Actually, a chymotrypsin blockade is where it Well, of was. course, bortezio mib is a, is a proteasome inhibitor. Anyway, MIB is not an antibody. It's something right. else. Exactly. Just, so we're, this is a small molecule inhibitor and not a monoclonal antibody. Okay. So, so, so Bortezio MIB and MG132 do not still, in, I'm sorry, do inhibit the, the mutants that they selected, which are resistant to their drugs. So they obviously have a different target in the proteasome because we, we know these are proteasome inhibitors. So they couldn't simply use known proteasome inhibitors to say that's where our drug is, is acting because they, they inhibited the mutants. These are unique proteasomes for this kinetoplastid group. And that's that that's the virtue of this drug. That's right. So then they introduced the uh, mutation uh, ectopically. They simply have a gene on a plasmid, which they can introduce ectopically into these uh, T. cruzi cells, and they can now make a resistant protein, and that confers resistance to their drug when you introduce this mutation. So the ultimate genetic proof by introducing uh, the mutation. So basically their target for this drug is a uh, subunit of the proteasome. Then then go on and say which part of the proteasome uh, is the target. The uh, T. cruzi proteasome has seven alpha and seven beta subunits. Fourteen subunits, Dixon. That's a lot of subunits. Why so many? Oh, we can't ask why questions. <laughs> How and, come? And they, what, are, what, are the, what is the purpose of the the seven purpose? subunits? Yeah, what is the purpose? I actually found a website here that gives us a little clue into the, uh, Mab and MIB. the, the MABs and MIBs. So <laughs> if it's a chimeric antibody, so it's human mouse, then it's X imab. If it's completely humanized, then it's Zumab. Mm -hmm. If it's fully human, then it's Mumab. If it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, remember Gleevec? Remember we mm -hmm. embarrassed ourselves? Mm -hmm. Then it is tinib, like imatinib. Right. If it's a proteasome inhibition, then it's zomib, like bortezomib. Mm. And if it's a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibition, then it's cyclib. So all these little tags at the end, these tails, um, should steer us in the right connection. Right. So as long as we're willing to use Google and... <laughs> <laughs> you have to use. You have to be glib to come up with the answer. Here. Yes, hey, they they localize which subunit of the uh, mm. T. cruzi proteasome is inhibited by the drug. It's the it's the one with chymotrypsin like activity, right. uh, and they basically show that this is what the target of the drug is, and uh, that's what's driving resistance as well. The mutation in that subunit. Um, it's interesting. Um, they bring back Lineweaver Burke. Do you remember him? Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a plot of uh, chymotrypsin activity, for which you can use to distinguish competitive versus non-competitive models. It turns out that bortezomib yeah. is a substrate competitive inhibitor, and it's very different from GNF6702 as a non-competitive mode binds of inhibition. To the pocket it must bind in allosteric, yeah, allosteric inhibition. It must deform the enzyme in some way. Yeah. Uh, now, the the key here. Probably the most important part is that their drugs, GNF6702, has no measurable activity on the human proteasome. Isn't that important? I just wiped my brow f free of sweat. Yeah, worried because about this. otherwise it would have side effects. It <coughs> still could, Absolutely. but at least they're not going to be directed against oh, there must be some, the proteasome. You know, if you give too much of anything, it's going to be toxic. They're always off-target yeah. effects. Another good friend of mine, Socrates, once said <laughs> <laughs> You look like Socrates. No, you know, that was actually the first criticism that people who just read the abstract said, oh, you can't use this because we have proteasomes. It's going to be a huge right. problem. So I think it's crucial that there's this high therapeutic index, that yeah. there isn't a active, an, an activity on I our proteasomes. I wanted to give an example of that. In my early days... Here at Columbia, there was a miracle drug that was pur purported to cure trypanosomes, and they used a horse as the model for this. It was Trypanosoma evansi, and uh, that's a sexually transmitted trypanosome, by the way. And they were working on it up at American Cyanamid, and they had a they had throughput. They did like two drugs a week, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> not enough throughput. And one of the drugs that they came up with actually cured the horse of Trypanosoma equipertum, or Trypanosoma evansi, in a day. The unfortunate part of this experiment it was the, the next day it killed the horse. <laughs> so the okay. drug was known as pyromycin. We're still using pyromycin. It's a protease inhibitor. No. Protein inhibitor. 
It inhibits the synthesis. synthesis of proteins. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's, that's, <laughs> hey, you jumped on my neck before I got a chance to I didn't touch myself. your neck. <laughs> I feel your hands around my neck. <laughs> I would never do that. I do yell at you, but I wouldn't physically assault No, you. no, I knew the difference. Okay. I knew the difference. But that was a great example of a therapeutic index of one. <laughs> it's yes. One kills the horse, one kills the parasite. So you, you want to go away from that and get the number as big as you can get, like one in 2,000. So this drug, they find um, it. there's a potential binding pocket on the proteasome subunit, which they found it inhibits the activity in intact T. cruzi cells. And they say, you know, this is, gonna, is being evaluated in preclinical toxicity studies, which means in small animal models. And if it passes it, then it could go into a phase one in people. Although they say it may not be good to have one inhibitor for all of these infections. Maybe we should develop ones that are specific. Because then you can sell them for three times the amount of money. (laughs) I don't, you know, it took them so long to, to generate an organism that was resistant. So maybe this is, you know, broad spectrum. um, Well, they say here, the identification of a broadly active pan-kinetoplastid drug may not be feasible or desirable as such a drug would need to reach high concentrations in various tissues and might carry increased toxicity risk. Instead, alternative analogs from the series with different profiles might be needed. So they may not use one for all of these infections, but simply tailor uh, to, to individual ones. But nevertheless, it's very promising. Right? Very promising. Would you agree, Daniel? I really would. I, I was rather impressed by this. I mean, the activity in this in, in vitro and in, in mouse models is impressive. Now what happens in safety and in people, we'll see. But that could be So you have a picture of the binding site? Oh, I, I do, actually. Why would Novartis do this, Dixon? Could they make money? Uh, it depends on the infection. <laughs> you know, these are infections of very poor people, usually. Yeah, I know. But Chagas, right, we have over 300,000 people in the United States with Chagas mm-hmm. who we think need treatment. Sure. We're not sure what well, to do with yeah. these people. What so, if we could treat blood with it? And we in Spain, talk, there's we, a lot in Spain. So there's a lot of... I'm not even worried yeah. about the people. What about blood? We've bags? talked about, in one of our case studies, you said the gentleman had Chagas, and the difficulty is whether to treat him with this very toxic drug. Which they don't want to take. They don't want to take, yeah. yeah. Take. And, you know, and we're not even sure. There was a study um, about a, probably a year or two ago now where they took the people they thought were the highest risk, the people that really needed to be treated, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't really clear that there was a benefit to the benzodiazole treatment. So we may actually need an effect. It may not just be that we need a better or less toxic. We may actually need a treatment that has proven efficacy. Um, these people are going to go on and develop, a lot of them are going to go at 10, 20% will develop cardiac manifestations, heart sure. failure, very expensive as far as, far as impact um, loss of work and etc. So, D- Dixon, I have a title: One Drug That Rules Them All. I like that. This course is not all, but right. Some so of the them. point Wait, is, go ahead. I mean, I think that you would have to achieve a very high therapeutic index in order to get this to work against Street T. Cruzi or Leishmania because they're both tissue parasites. Whereas the trypanosome, sleeping sickness organism, is a bloodstream organism and would be. Mm-hmm attackable with a much lower dosage, I would think. Yeah. So that's Fair the point. reason why they yes. would try to vary Fair the... Point. And maybe it won't get into the CNS or not. I mean, that'll be an issue, like what's yeah, the absolutely. CNS penetration? Well, it looks like a big molecule. It looks pretty... I used to call those molecules dihydroxy chicken wire. Dihydroxy yeah. but the, chicken wire. Because that's what they look yeah, like. Yeah, but the one yes. model, right, with the mice, they're actually doing um, sleeping sickness with CNS. So I, I'm thinking this may get into the CNS. It may simply be knocking out the blood burden of parasites, and that and that might be enough. Yeah, well, enough, you know, sure. No, but I those will be interesting things down the road. See, what is see. the tissue penetration of these different? What does it get into cardiac myocytes? Et From this study, we don't know if it gets into yeah. CNS. You know, it, I mean, it ends up. But what a high bar for a publication these days, right? I mean, they screen three Amazing. million compounds, then they make three thousand variations on the one that they're excited <laughs> about. And then they go ahead and they four different disease models. I mean, this is... Dixon, uh, don't you wish you had done this work? I'm not a chemist. I thought I wanted to be at one point early in my career. <laughs> mm. I took one biochemistry course on the downtown campus at Columbia with a guy by the name of Shaman, who was famous for having deciphered the uh, structure of the porphyrin ring for hemoglobin. Shaman. You mean that's a toilet paper guy, Shaman? No. no oh, that's, that's Charmin. Charmin. Dixon, Shaman. maybe you were an alchemist. 
No, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I did well up until the point that they started to get mathematical on me, and then I started to they got mathematical. fade. Daniel, I, do you have another case for us? I oh, my another goodness. Case. Does it? And this case involves, let me see, no Keep math. these away from No me. math. No math. And there's nothing. No math? Yeah, no math. And I've actually, well, got a chance, the man is 36, so we have those numbers. 36 still. years And what old, I've done though. is I've now shielded any information that can give it away to, Dixon can look over, and there's yeah. nothing that can give away no, to case. Look out the window. Mine was a glance of less than a second. And you did it on was. purpose. I knew what that you was. dog, you. Well, you got it right. No, I, want Dixon, <laughs> I want Dixon to look good in, in front of the listening public. So, okay. Yeah, Dixon's not worried about We it. are still in Thailand. Really? But now we're dealing with a man not from the southern portion of Thailand, but a 36 year old man from the northeast part of Thailand. Okay. It sounds like near uh, the, the Cambodian border. Did you uh, go there as well on your recent trip? I was actually up in this. Yeah, so this, was this is from your recent trip. Yes, okay. this is from the recent trip. Wow, it's very we went valuable. Over to see him reap. I, you know, I was in I was in Bangkok for a while, and then I was up in the northern part of Thailand. I was up by the uh, Burmese border. That's very could true. actually you could see yeah. Burma, Myanmar, whatever we're supposed to call it these days. Right. All right. Um, before heading down to Cambodia, northeast part of the country. Okay, what's wrong with this man? Um, so this man comes in with abdominal distension. I expect our listeners, I expect our emailers to get this right, except some of you. <laughs> now, what do you think he eats? A normal diet, a normal Thai diet oh, of, of now we're familiar with these foods, right. som tam, right. koi pla, which is the raw fish pickled in the lime juice, um, eats a lot of rice. Um, he, he feels well. He actually feels okay in contrast to the other person. But why does he come to see us? He comes to see us because he's noticed that He's getting yellowing of his skin and yellowing of what had been the whites of his eyes. <laughs> right? So he's starting to look. We have another I think word for we this. We have a word for that. <laughs> jaundiced. Correct. He's starting to get jaundiced, but he doesn't know that word. No. So he's just starting. Now, this is a 36-year-old gentleman who had previously been um, healthy. No right. prior medical problems. No right. surgery. He doesn't take any medicine. He's not allergic to anything because he's never taken anything. Um family he doesn't know of any diseases that run in the family um he's a fisherman but not down in the south he's a fisherman now up in the northeast still fresh water um still fresh water he has a wife and he has many children um with the same wife with the same wife yes and is he monogamous he is monogamous hiv negative he is hiv negative um he lives in a small village that's right along the river um, in the, you know, as we say, in the Northeast jungle. So it's a jungle area. He's living in a, one of these stilted village um, right along the river. He says many dogs, many animals. They've got, you know, they've got uh, chickens and monkeys. There, there are monkeys. There are All monkeys. Kinds. Dogs, chickens, monkeys. You name it. Mm-hmm. He lives in a in a raised hut on stilts. Exactly, it's not a concrete house. And where does he go right. to the bathroom? Um, he outside. He does, he does not have a good good facilities. <laughs> okay, outside. So the, outside. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever that river is. <laughs> yeah, wow. He is an outside latrine when he's you know at the village. How lucky we are, Dixon. Tell me about it. We weren't always this lucky. Tell me again what the toilet did for us. The development of the toilet? It trapped all of the microbes that were all screened from catching now, right? Makes you it dig a, true, a hole six true feet one deep. way. I don't know one virus that could ever crawl out of that latrine, <laughs> including yours, the one you were, used to work on polio. He has no fever? He does not have a fever. He is without fever. He's thin. He's a thin guy. <laughs> um, How long has his belly been distended? Um, this has been going on for a while. Uh, what do you mean for a while? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say... Uh, you want to try to define that a little more? A month, two months? <laughs> I'm going to say... I'd say months. Yeah. months. Has it been getting bigger is it and getting bigger worse? Yeah. Just, just Boom, it was distended and that yeah. was that. So it's, it's getting bigger. I'm actually going to give you guys the bigger. exam and then, then you can ask some more right, questions. Sorry, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, this is good. So he is, um, as mentioned, he has um, he's jaundiced. Mm -hmm. he, he has some yellowing of the whites of his eyes. So we call that scleral icterus. Yes. Um his belly, um, he has a large, palpable, non-tender mass below the liver. Okay? 
and uh, and and it, and I think this is a, this is an important part of the exam. When you examine this man, so he's laying down, um, and you're in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen. You're just below the liver. There isn't there isn't really noticeable enlargement of the liver, mm -hmm. but just below the liver, you feel something that is large, non tender. Um, feels like a mass and sort of pushing just under the liver. And so that's gonna. I think when we put these together, they should give us our clues. So here we are, Northeast Thailand this um, sort of exposure history and large tender below the liver. Sorry, on, on his left or right side? His right side. So like where the gallbladder would be, below the gallbladder? It's It would be where the gallbladder would be. Or the uh, pancreas as well? So where's the pancreas? We should talk about the pancreas. Across, is, right? It goes across, but it's retroperitoneal. So it's the back. all the way in the back up against the spine. So you're you're probably not going to feel that. Got it. If you go in really deep, sometimes a pseudocyst or sometimes tenderness, but that's going to be a deep palpation. This is just right up surface. front here. Hmm. All right. And just tell us where the spleen is in case somebody's thinking along spleen those. Spleen is over on your left side. The man does not have an enlarged or tender palpable spleen. Or liver. Or liver. Or liver. So no hepatosplenoma. No hepatosplenomegaly, no enlarged liver, no enlarged spleen. But a mass. But some sort of palpable um, yes. mass below the liver. And as Vincent points out, in the area where the gallbladder would be. And is causing him to become jaundiced. Well, we don't know. You think it's... Well, you, you think it's, he was... You think it's tied down. No, he's jaundiced. You think, you think what we're feeling is tied in with the jaundice? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, that's a good question, of course. Yes. Um, Dixon, if you, uh, if you simply ligate the bile duct would someone become jaundiced i think that's true they would okay what does the doctor think depends where you do the ligation okay ah. <laughs> very good Aha. okay uh is yeah, that you do it in the... queens brooklyn is that all the information we're i think getting? that's all but do you anyone have any other questions this is it you're the last chance is there for any our animal husbandry associated with this gentleman um He's a he's a fisherman, so he personally know he's out there fishing. Or in the community that he's part of. There, there is definitely animal husbandry going on. A deaf, and what are they uh, husbandry? In? <laughs> um, as mentioned, the chickens. I don't think the dogs is a husbandry Any issue. They're not eating husbandries? them. I mean, sheep. Um, there are goats. Goats. Goats um, and sheep. Goats. Mm -hmm. You didn't say sheep, but Vincent did. Did you? Vincent did. I think that's. I I don't know if sheep, I actually saw goats, any dogs, sheep. Dogs, cows, cats. There are there are some. Uh, there's the Cape Buffalo. There's some, yeah, there's a... Well, Pigs? There, water Buffalo. There, water Buffalo. Water, yeah, the Water Buffalo. Pig? Cape, not Cape. <laughs> no, 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 no. The there cape. would be no people left. Yes. <laughs> are, there, are there pigs? There are pigs. Are there pigs? There are Great lots question. of pigs. There's also um, frogs. They're raising frogs in these villages Amazing. for food. They have these um, concrete things wow. where they're raising frogs. Wow. Um, and lots of pigs. And snakes, of course. They're all over the place. Snakes everywhere. <laughs> yes. They eat frogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and Russell's viper is the biggest one that they're worried about over there. I was worried about the cobra. Viper. I learned how to distinguish the different cobra, <laughs> but apparently I can only tell if it's leaving, if it's going away from me, <laughs> if it's coming towards me. <laughs> Whatever the cobra's type is, I don't want it. <laughs> now, uh, he doesn't, this onset of um, distension. As we not, it's been going on for months. Months, and he doesn't remember any particular incident associated with that. No. It's been the gradual. His noticed. usual life routines and eating and so forth. Uh, nothing special. Nothing, right? nothing. He didn't special. go anywhere. He's the only one in his family with this. Interesting enough, yeah. Interesting and and enough. the um, he hasn't traveled, right? He's always no. been here. Okay, he's been up. And why did he come in? He noticed he was starting to turn yellow. I see. John, no, because he yeah. feels fine. So it's it's right. the differential for painless so, jaundice in northeastern Thailand. So if he had. This distended abdomen, that enough? That was not enough to get him to go? A lot of people have distended abdomen. Is that right? Abdomens, right? A lot of people have distended abdomen. Yeah, but if abdomens. it suddenly appears over a few-month period, you would think, ah, <laughs> uh, something's going on here. Dixon, if you got... Oh, you... You, <laughs> you know, Vincent... <laughs> Let's be nice to Dixon. You've just gone too far. You've stepped off an edge. <laughs> you were, used to be a skinny guy. Let's say within a two-month period, if you developed no, a distended right. abdomen, would you go f <laughs> seek medical care in the absence of jaundice? If I started to turn yellow... Well, of course. I mean, I would be concerned about that. Of course I would be. If you didn't, your wife would make you. Well, if I was young, I wouldn't have been married, but that's okay. You asked me if I was when I was young, thin. No, <laughs> you were thin not too long ago. 
I mean, you got to realize <laughs> these, these people are Buddhists. So what's the central Buddhist dogma is that life is suffering. So, you know, you, you don't you don't necessarily go to the doctor at the drop of a and hat. Buddha was not a thin person. Well, so there are, <laughs> there are not necessarily doctors to go to, right? And actually for this gentleman, it's it's quite a trip. So he's got to start off in Northeast Thailand. And this is just give you the bureaucracy of their system. He's got to go to one of these local healthcare volunteers. Mm-hmm. And then he has to go to the local... They've renamed them hospitals, but I was at one of these, and it's really just a clinic, but it's called gathering, a hospital. Gathering of patients. And then the <laughs> they have to refer you to the regional yeah. hospital, and then the regional hospital has to decide yeah. you're yeah. sick enough that you need to go to Bangkok to the ID hospital. Or so. Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai has a Or Chiang Mai hospital. also is an excellent. You've been there, Dixon? Yes, I have. Wow, you've traveled. Wow. <laughs> Well, you haven't traveled. <laughs> Mine, you've been I've to never Australia. been to Southeast Asia. Well, you'd like it, I think you would. I would like to go to uh, to Food's Vietnam. Really actually, good. you like? To- have you been to Vietnam? I have not been there. I've I'd been like to, to go, but it's not in the cards. The food in Vietnam is awesome. I've been to Japan, but that's not Southeast Asia, and Japan is awesome. That's true. Any parasite infections in Japan, Dixon? <laughs> there Lots. used to be a lot. There used to be a lot. They had a lot of malaria and they had a lot of schistosomiasis and they've gotten rid of both of those things. They had a parasite museum, but I, my you family didn't, didn't go, want to go. Didn't go. How could you not go? It was outside the city and my family didn't want to go. And I didn't I'm, really. I'm going in December. I'll take pictures Please for go you. take People pictures. go there just to get married. They get married in front of the large <laughs> Buy, buy some swag and I'll pay you for it. Okay. If, oh, they, have some some parasite, if they have some parasite shirts or shirts. trinkets okay. that you put on your cell phone, that sort that's of right. thing, just okay. buy them and we'll pay for them. Absolutely. Uh, I want to tell you about the other. Uh, is that it for you? I want to move on to the rest. I've of this. heard enough. Okay, me too. I've heard <laughs> All you enough. need to know. I want to tell you, you about the uh, the other sponsor of this episode, which is Drobo. They make a family of devices for you to store data on your computer. But as we told you last time, you can't look at your watch. How how terrible and rude is that for you to do? Why would you bring that up in a moment like now? <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. You, you make me feel badly. Cut it out. I cut, cut to it an out. ad, and then you go look at your watch. <laughs> They're paying our way. You can't do that. <laughs> they uh, make a family of storage devices, which you put hard drives into, and you attach them to your computer. And we told you last time about how all of the hard drives you put into a Drobo, which can have three or five or eight or 12 slots, they become one giant hard drive that you can use, uh, that it's 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 aware of how much space you have. It tells you how much via lights on the front of the apparatus, and... It protects your data. If any one of the drives fail, you can just take it out, put a new one in, and all the data are restored. I want to tell you now about how Drobo has been encouraging developers to make Drobo apps. And these are apps that give added value to your Drobo. And there are four different kinds. There are apps that let you back up to different cloud service providers from your Drobo. So you could have all the files on your Drobo go up to the cloud, which is very important to do because, you know, you could have all your files on a Drobo and it may last your life. But if someone comes in and steals it, those data are gone. So these Drobo apps will help you back up the data to a cloud a cloud service. Uh, you can also use the Drobo to run a website. There is a full LAMP stack. Dixon, do you know what LAMP stands for? L-A-M-P. It's not a light. Clue. Lamp is what you put on a machine to run a website. What does it stand for? Vincent? Educate you. Linux, <laughs> Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Those you are see, the I would have things. never known. Those are the things. four things Linux you I've need to run a website. Uh-huh. So you can use one of these apps to run it right on your Drobo. Would you like to run a website, Dixon? No, you can have other people do it for you. <laughs> I don't want to be a webmaster. I want to. Yeah, I want the content. If you want to put all of your home entertainment on your Drobo, you can use a program called Plex and stream it to your stream. TV. Now I know, I know what that from means. your Drobo in their apps to do that. And finally, you could share your media like a, with with an app that does uh, what a BitTorrent client would do to gather files or distribute them. And you can even run email on your Drobo as well. Now, the models 5N and 810N are network storage systems and those are the ones you can extend their capabilities by using these Drobo apps because they're plugged into your switch or router and you could, in theory, access them from anywhere. Next time, we'll tell you exactly how that works. Uh, listeners of TWIP can save $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo Mini 5D 5N or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code 
microbe100, all one word, microbe and then 100. You get $100 off uh, on these on the purchase of these wonderful storage devices. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIP. What do you think, Dixon? Is that a good ad spot? Wow, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get two. <laughs> I think we all want to get one of the ones with well, I already have 12 one. drives. 12 oh, drives. A 12 <laughs> no, drive would be so cool. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> I wonder how much a 12 drive Drobo is. That's a good question. Let's look it up. I just want to Drobo.com. We'll just extend the ad spot a little here because I would like to have a product. Uh, Maybe they'll give us one to field test. 12 Drive. Where's 12 Drive? You could run a small country with one of those things. I you could run a small country? I believe you could, given the uh, memory system. <clears throat> you could store all the Russian secrets on it. <laughs> 1200i. Oh, look at that. It's just horizontal 12 <laughs> drives, 128 terabytes. I, I have to get this, but I'm kind of tight for money right now. I think I have to go to Drobo Store. <laughs> And then you find com. out how much this costs. And find out how much it is. Should I read one of these emails while you're while you're searching yeah, go ahead to see with the spend one. more than on a Lamborghini? So Carol <laughs> writes a few more emails here. So Carol writes, Greetings, Twip Team Twip. I'm writing from beautiful Vancouver Island, BC, where it is sunny and warm at thirty two C without a cloud in the sky. My guess for the unfortunate boy in episode one fourteen is Nagleria Falari. Colic how do you pronounce that word? Colloquially. Colloquially. That's quite a word. Colloquially known as the brain-eating amoeba. The warm, fresh water made me initially suspect this and the poor outcome reinforced it. All right. Fresh water is two words, by the way. It's actually one word. No, but I think it was that the water was fresh. It hadn't been sitting around. It was fresh, fresh water. No, 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 no. It was not salt water. It was fresh water. Right, so the, the Drobo 12 is $4,000. That's so not that, so that bad. really is. I that's, can't do that. Know, I can't okay. do it. That's one tire of a Lamborghini. <laughs> so still, still not in the price range of a uh, Columbia professor. Well, I, I'm, I got three kids in college <laughs> right now. I can't do any of this luxury spending. I have to. Oh. My wife and I are emptying our refrigerator at the moment. We're not even buying food. <laughs> oh, now come on! I don't believe you that. See how long we can go by just eating what's in the house. <laughs> no, maybe I should do that. Who I knows? have some leftover food from the cart, Vincent. Just to let you know. <laughs> All right, I'll read the next one. <laughs> go ahead, Dick. Caleb writes, "Greetings." Uh, that's not the same Caleb. I wonder if it is though. Caleb writes, "Greetings all." Case diagnosis. I hope all is well, and a new twip will be recorded soon. While well, we're doing that right now, first of all, I would like to take a guess at the case presentation from Twip One Fourteen. The 12-year-old boy brought to the hospital ER by parents with severe headache, stiff neck, fever, decreased alertness, I believe, as Negleria phalari or Negleriasis. The severe headache, stiff neck, and fever are all classic symptoms of this infection, but what clinched the diagnosis for me was that the boy was swimming in warm, fresh water, mm -hmm. in this case, a single word, fresh water, <laughs> a place where the amoeba can be found. The other very sad detail Dr. Griffin pointed out was the point that a, patholo a pathologist was involved in a high percentage of cases of nigleriasis. The patients do not make it. <clears throat> I want to thank you for all the time and effort that you put into making these informative podcasts. Comments. On a lighter note, first of all, First off, I want to thank you again for providing such wonderful information on these podcasts. My wife, third-year medical student, just recently completed and did very well. I might add on her SEPT-1 boards. Step. Step-1 boards, I'm sorry, SEPT-1 boards. While studying for exam, she always dreaded studying the parasites, epidemiology, and drugs to treat said parasites. But with the help of this show, I was able to sit down with her, and we were able to go through parasite by parasite learning all about each one. While many of the parasites I had known previously to be listening to TWIP, I am a PhD student in medical entomology, some of the parasites, which are not transmitted via insect vectors, I did not know about. Through listening to this show, I not only have passed countless hours in the lab running experiments, but also found a practical application for the use of this newly acquired knowledge. So I thank you all very much. Lastly, I have two fascinating, in parens, I found them fascinating. She, on the other hand, came home scratching and disgusted. Cases my wife had run into during her first few months of clinical training in the hospital. The first case was while she was working in the wound clinic. She is currently at the VA hospital in Los Angeles. When a patient came in 
to have his soft cast replaced. As she was removing the soft cast, the patient began telling her and the resident that he was currently living with a friend who had bed bugs, and that he believed that the bed bugs had gotten into his cast and were biting him. As they continued to unwrap the cast, bed bugs began falling out of his cast and onto the floor. While she was telling me this story later that evening, she was cringing at the fact that this patient had bed bugs. My only question to her was if she had collected uh, any for me to look at. Because <laughs> he wanted some, of course, why not? The second case was again in the wound clinic when a patient came in who was non-ambulatory and was brought in via wheelchair. As my wife and the resident approached this patient, the resident noticed that the patient had a layer of crust all over his hands and began asking um, and um, began asking the patient about it. The patient said that it had been there for a year or so, and the resident just thought it might have been a fungal infection of some kind. My wife <laughs> politely informed her resident after leaving the room that the crusted layer on the patient's hands looked like Norwegian scabies. As it turned out, the patient was hepatitis C, and HIV positive, and indeed had a case of Norwegian scabies. While Norwegian scabies has been discussed in their parasitology slash infectious disease course in her first year, she happened to remember me showing her pictures of it after I had <laughs> listened to TWIP 97, the seven-year itch. I would like to thank you all again for the hard work you put into on these amazing podcasts and to keep up the good work. I look forward to hearing TWIP 115. Well, that's already in the can. Cheers, Cal. Entomology Outreach Coordinator, PhD student, medical and veterinary uh, entomology, the University of California, Riverside. It's a great place to study, by the way. And there's a lot of good people there, too. Jeff, Jeff writes, Dear doctors, thank you so much for the podcast. So informative and very current, especially twee. He probably means twee. probably means twip. Anywho, <laughs> anywho <laughs> I believe that the poor child, even though... It is extremely rare and often misdiagnosed as meningitis, was suffering from nigleriasis. Unfortunately, he was not diagnosed in time. Otherwise, a course of treatment would have been therapeutic hypothermia and milfet miltefacine. Thanks for sharing your fountains of knowledge. It is hot on Long Island. I don't do weather <laughs> forecasting. <laughs> Jeff. Jeff. And uh, Anthony sends a link to a paper of the Royal Society, and it is called Host Stress Hormones Alter Vector Feeding Preferences, Successes, and Productivity. So in other words, the hormones being made by a host can influence what bites that person. Interesting. That is interesting. Hmm. I'll have to take a look at that. <clears throat> so if you're relaxed, are you less likely to be? Maybe. If you're stressed, you're maybe more likely to be bitten. All right, Daniel. Okay, dear Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel, I have a strong suspicion that the 12-year-old has a rare case of the deadly Nigleria phalari. The symptoms line up pretty well. Freshwater ponds, stiff neck, brain swelling, rapid onset, eosinopenia. The only hesitation with that diagnosis is that Nagleria is extremely rare. Only 130 cases of Nagleria have been reported with only three survivors. I do hope that the case Daniel presented is actually about one of those lucky survivors. Namely, a 12-year-old girl who was treated with rifampin, amphotericin, azithromycin, fluconazole, and dexamethasone. I hope that Daniel just relabeled her as a boy to make it more difficult to find, but I really did not know, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, recently, an antiparasitic drug, miltefacine, was used with a partial success, one out of two survivors. Miltefacine may also help with Balmuthia mandrillaris, another likely suspect in this case. But I would like to stick with Naglaria diagnosis, more of a guess. Thank you for making my all-time's favorite podcast. Best regards, Ruben, UCSD School of Pharmacy. Nice. See, we had a lot of guesses on the Naglaria coming in after we, we did. published. We did, yeah. Came in a little episode. late. Sure. Please, Dixon. Anthony writes, Up until maybe 20 years ago, there were distinct seasons here in Jersey City. It generally got cold in late December and stayed cold until March. My speculation is that the seven several month long layer of snow protected the leaf litter underneath which adults were where adult insects, larvae, and eggs sorry. I'll read that sentence again. My speculation is that the several month long layer of snow protected the leaf litter underneath where adult insects, larvae, and eggs overwintered. 
Now, there's a cycle of thaws and freezes that kill off many of the insects. Cicada grubs in deep earth around tree roots will be protected. Mosquitoes on the walls of sewers do very well. Down there, they can remain blissfully unaware of the slings and arrows of climate change and just enjoy the good fortune of an early spring. Politicians dramatically send out aviators to attack the summer wetlands to combat mosquitoes. It wouldn't be, wouldn't it? It won't be as interesting. It won't be as interesting on the evening news, but eradicating the mosquitoes in the residential sewers during the winter will probably be a lot more effective. There are indeed bats in Jersey City. Around 50 years ago, I managed to rescue one knocked off the side of a house here in the heights by water from a hose. Unfortunately, there was nothing like the twiv then, so I didn't know anything about rabies. Mm-hmm. Neither penmanship nor artistic ability has improved, but he actually sends us his version of the bat. And in his class, in his grade school, I guess it was, uh, he wrote about this incident. And um, it said... It's hmm. so cute. It must, it's him writing as a child, right? Yeah, right. it is. Dear Ms. Nolan, please tell Donna Griffins, no relative, <laughs> that I do intend to touch a bat again. <clears throat> but also tell her in about 20 years, and but also tell everybody, I said, thank you. I enjoyed their letters. It's a nice drawing. Read that okay. It's a cute drawing of a bat, isn't it? It's, it's quite it touching. Really it's, it's, it's very charming. It's very charming. Thank you. Uh, Mo writes, hello, Twip <laughs> friends. Just wanted to drop you a quick line in response to the letter read near the end of TWIP 115, RE similar, seemingly fewer insects to be found this year. I am somewhat relieved yet also perplexed to learn that I am not the only person who is seeing fewer insects this spring and summer, especially at night. I've always looked forward to finding many species of night-flying creatures at my porch light after sunset, but this year the offerings have been scarce to say the least. I and others in my area have also reported a sharp decline in the number of Argiope Orantia, writing spider this year as well. Most summers I can count between 15 to 20 mature females in my yard by August, but this year there are none. We do not use pesticides, nor have we changed anything about our gardening, so it's a mystery to me where these beautiful spiders have gone. The good news is that I have had an increase in the number of swallowtail and monarch caterpillars. In fact, I am on my way home now to check on a ripe monarch chrysalis to see if the butterfly eats. Eclosed today. Is that the right word, Dixon? Eclosed? Yeah. The temperature in Norfolk, Virginia this afternoon is warm but pleasant at 84F with 56% humidity, a slight breeze, and plentiful sunshine. I am enjoying my free trial to Curiosity Stream. Nice. And intend to continue with a paid subscription when the what? trial is up. Thanks for making this known and available to your audience. And thanks, as always, for all you do. Keep on twipping on. Cheers, Morgan. P.S. I wrote to you earlier this year about entomophagy. It is probably safe to say that entomophagy is not popular enough yet to be the cause <laughs> of the decreased number of insects right. many people <laughs> have observed. Sarah writes, Dear Twippers, I am a new listener, having been directed to TWIP and TWIV by a fellow member of our medical school's infectious disease interest group. I'm sad to admit our group only seems to have four members, <laughs> but maybe that would improve if more of my classmates listen to your podcast. Huh. I have yet to listen to many of the podcasts, but I have watched every episode of Monsters Inside Me, <laughs> which emboldens me to venture a diagnosis. My initial instinct, because you mentioned warm water exposure and an unfavorable outcome, is the tabloid-famed brain-eating amoeba Nigleria phalari, causing primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. This would be consistent with the patient's symptoms of headache, fever, stiff neck, and decreased alertness as well. As for the sad outcome of this case, fatality rates for N. phalari infection approach 99%. The majority of N. phalari infections are in young males, like our patients, and it is not a geographically limited infection. Acanthamoeba and balamuthia could also cause an encephalitis, but generally only in immunocompromised patients with a less fulminant course. According to the CDC, imaging tends to be nonspecific. Low glucose, high protein, and increased cellularity in the CSF are all consistent with N. phalari infection. Bacterial meningitis would have some similar findings, but the patient did not improve with presumptive treatment and no bacteria were found in the CSF. 
I'm not sure what to make of the eosinopenia, but it can occur with protozoan infections, as I learned from episode 109, so perhaps that is the explanation. N. Fowleri could be diagnosed by visualizing the trophozoites in freshly acquired CSF, but unfortunately there is not an established treatment. Some have had success with amphotericin B plus rifampin, but there are too few known survivors of this infection to nail down the best treatment. I'm not sure if my diagnosis is correct, but it's my best guess. I'm excited to hear the answer and to have found your podcast. Best wishes, Sarah. Last one, Dixon. Well, okay then. Trudy writes, Dear Twippers, even though I'm a long-time fascinated listener, I was not officially motivated to make a guess on your case studies until TWIP 114. Being a mother of two small children, the sudden death of the 12-year-old boy absolutely horrified me. Unfortunately, Dr. Griffin's emphasis on the dog exposure and the mention of a repeated mosquito bites threw me, so I never sent you my guess. However, now that I know the cause of the boy's death, I feel compelled to write you due to a couple of personal experiences. Almost exactly a year ago, a friend of mine here in Atlanta, Georgia, was hospitalized with an inexplicable encephalitis, which three weeks later turned out to be fatal. Tragically, she left behind a husband and two little girls. To my knowledge, no autopsy was performed, and apparently the cause is still unknown, although West Nile virus and Neglaria falleri were among the speculative guesses. I was afraid to ask her husband about it, as he was busy dealing with the aftermath of the situation. I attached a couple of articles about this baffling case, and she gives the links. I also want to mention that I recently attended a company picnic at Fort Yargo Lake here in Georgia, where I took both of my two-year-old daughters and six-month-old son into the water with me. I tend to live my life according to cost-benefit analyses based on factual information (laughs) rather than based on fear, and I simply wanted my daughter to have some unimpeded fun in the water. However, at that point, I had not yet heard of episode 115 on TWIP, and I must admit that I am now fully full of anxiety, especially considering the recollection that my daughter did stumble at some point, briefly submerging her head underwater. As I was listening to episode 115 on my drive into work this morning, August 31st, I had to pull over and look up the incubation period for Nicolaria falori, which according to various internet sources is anywhere between 1 and 15 days. Even though the skeptic in me tells me that we're not 100% in the clear, I have to admit that I breathed a huge sigh of relief as our little excursion took place on the 14th. (laughs) Right. I mean, I I hate to say this, but we do cause some anxiety in some of our listeners. I'm not (laughs) sure if this means that we will never swim in lakes again, but I might limit our exposure to deeper areas of the lake rather than at the beachfront, as I understand that the amoeba live in the dirt, correct? Thank you so much for continuing for f- to further my knowledge. At all the best from a shaken but slightly empowered mom. Trudy, P.S., I've attached a picture of my kids and me in the lake. <laughs> and they are adorable. adorable. They are absolutely, three of them <laughs> together make the, the most adorable trio of anything I've ever seen recently. So, how what was the temperature of the lake? I think that's a big determining factor here. And it, if it didn't exceed like seventy five or eighty degrees, then maybe there's nothing to worry about ever. Is, aren't most of the cases associated with kids jumping in water and having force yeah. force water forced up the nose? Is it that is, right? uh, Vincent. I, I think you're correct. Um, usually, there's some kind of a jump, and and we mm-hmm. believe it's it's water going through the cribriform plate, mm-hmm. which, which yeah. probably is. You know, a jump, not holding your nose, et cetera. So when my kids maybe jump off that bridge in Cape Cod into the water, I'm putting <laughs> myself at risk for their benefit. No, I think no, that and you're the, okay. And the other, <laughs> the, I guess the co- a couple other things I'll say is, as Dixie, you were starting to mention, temperature is a big factor. Yeah, the warmer the lake, the higher mm-hmm. the risk. Everybody should live in the Northeast. Um, and uh, as far as where they live, so it depends on the different amoeba. We, we, we have our three big, right? We've got our um, Neglaria. Um, Naglaria lives in warm water. Yes, we have Balamuthia mandrillaris. That's a soil dwelling yeah. amoeba. Um, we have Acanth amoeba. Um, that's yeah. in that's you know sort of contaminating water mixed again. Habitats. Yeah, it's mixed. So lovely hat, Trudy. That's pretty cool. No, no, it's a great picture. It's a great, really picture. nice. Thank you. And that'll do it for Twip One One Six. You can find it at iTunes and also microbe.tv slash Twip. Consider becoming a patron of TWIP and the Microbe TV family of science shows. You can go to patreon.com slash microbe TV 
Contribute a little as a dollar a month to help us push these shows forward. Or you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for some other donation options. Another thing you can do to help us, even if you don't listen to our show on iTunes, go over there, find the show, and give it a rating. You can give it one to five stars. Of course, you'll give us five stars. It's a five-star show for sure. That What does that do? It makes us rise higher in the iTunes rating. So when new people come looking for science shows, they'll find us and they can hear all about the cool world of parasites. We love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. As always, Dixon de Pommier is at Tricanella.org. Gracias, Dixon. De nada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.